medium-sized asteroid impact. Imagine an Eiffel Tower-sized asteroid heading for Earth. It's moving at 60 times the speed of sound, carrying the energy of thousands of nuclear bombs. When it hits the atmosphere, the air in front of it is compressed so fast it ignites into a fireball brighter than the sun. You see it light up the sky and burn your eyes to dust. It's a very plausible scenario, we know it's happened before. There have been confirmed extinction events, and near misses as recent as 2019, when a 100 meter wide asteroid passed closer than some of our satellites. If you're on the wrong side of Earth, near the impact, you die instantly. But what if you're on the other side? Surely you survive, right? Well, it depends. Let's assume a few likely parameters of the asteroid, like density and angle of impact. The impact is Kansas, right in the center of the United States. The crater diameter is only 4.3 kilometers, and if you're unlucky to be right under it, well, yeah, you'd be crushed, obviously. Up to 50 kilometers from the impact, you wouldn't be crushed, but you'd burn to death, probably. The fireball would be 35 times larger than the sun and burn everything around you, and the air blast itself would flatten every building and every tree to the ground. 1% survival rate. If you're in an underground bunker, that is. Between 50 and 150 kilometers radius of impact, your survival rate increases drastically. Now, the fireball is only 10 times larger than the sun, and while most of your body suffers first-degree burns, you might be able to survive, even without an underground bunker. Beyond 150 kilometers, your approximate chance of surviving the impact is above 95%. But survival doesn't mean safety. Within just 40 seconds of impact, you'll have to battle a magnitude 6.8 earthquake and devastating fires, all without proper emergency services. But yes, if you're on the other side of the world, let's say Western Australia, you'd be completely fine. You would notice the aftermath. Fuel prices spike, flights reroute, supply chains freeze, but mostly it's just something you'd hear on the news. Moon crashes into Earth. It sounds impossible, but the laws of physics say it can happen. If the moon's orbit ever became unstable, its own momentum could eventually drag it back down toward us. At first, only small changes would appear. The tides begin to rise higher every day, refusing to fall completely. Soon, beaches would disappear and cities along the coast would drown. You'd notice the moon growing larger in the night sky. First beautiful, then unsettling, then terrifying. Now, its gravity starts to really affect you, and the planet itself. The crust splits open, spewing magma into the air. The heat supercharges the air's conductivity covering the planet in electrical storms. And then, the end begins. The moon crosses what's called the Roch Limit, the point where Earth's gravity starts pulling the moon apart faster than it can hold itself together. It begins to crack and fracture from the inside. Friction and impacts between fragments heat everything into molten rock, glowing bright like fire. Within hours or days, the moon is no longer a single object, but a ring of debris orbiting Earth, like a new, fiery version of Saturn's rings. If you survive the tsunamis, the quakes, and the electrical storms, there's nothing left to do. You can only watch as those fragments rain down on Earth, turning the sky into fire, and killing you in the molten fallout of a dying moon. Nearby supernova, far from Earth, astronauts are the first to notice. A star that wasn't there yesterday, shining brighter than anything they have ever seen. At first they think it's a flare or a reflection from the sun, but it doesn't fade. It grows. A massive star, 100 light years away, has reached the end of its life. Inside the space station, alarms scream as radiation meters max out. The crew barely has time to react. Nausea hits first, then blindness. Blood vessels burst under their skin. Within an hour, all astronauts in space are dead from catastrophic cell damage and hemorrhage. On Earth, you're still alive. The atmosphere protects you, but only temporarily. Eventually, the ozone can't withstand the high-energy photons and begins to break down, so the sunlight starts to sting more than usual. People try to adapt, staying indoors during the day and only coming out at night. But UV radiation cuts through clouds, through glass, through everything. Within months, cancers spread like wildfire. The oceans, once blue, turn green with the bloom of dying plankton. If you step outside unprotected, it takes less than an hour to collapse. After a few years, the supernova's radiation finally fades. But the damage doesn't. Half the ozone layer is gone, ecosystems are wrecked, and humanity's numbers have collapsed. You probably won't survive this scenario, but don't worry. There is no known star within 100 light years ready to explode anytime soon, at least not for a few hundred million years. Earth leaving our solar system. Our solar system is stable for now, but a passing red dwarf could potentially drift close enough to pull our planet out of orbit. We'd be slingshotted away from our stable orbit around the sun. You wouldn't notice the shift. 
This is not something you can feel happening, just as you can't feel Earth moving at 30 kilometers per second, but it would still not come as a surprise. Astronomers already track about 90% of nearby stars within 100 light years. A star moving toward us fast enough to disturb the solar system, like Gliese 710, would be spotted centuries or millennia ahead. Which is why you remember the day you learned about it in school. They told you it would happen in your lifetime, and that you can already see the red dwarf in the sky. You get a whole subject dedicated to astronomy, and you learn about the orbital simulation that shows the trajectory. Gliese 720 will pass just alongside Earth. Only for a brief moment, but enough to change the course of humanity. You worry about this, but mom and dad says everything's going to be okay. Scientists are working on deflection projects, and they're smart. They'll figure out a solution. A decade's pass, and you've now got two suns in the sky, one yellow and one red. But as the years pass, both grow smaller, and your world turns ice cold. Scientists have gone from deflection solutions to mitigation solutions, but you got bigger problems. You have a family of your own, and you've been forced to migrate to southern parts of the world, much like everyone else. You tell your kids fondly at the big and warm sun you remember as a kid. They grow up with a cold, distant blip on the sky and endless winters. As Earth passes Mars, the average temperature on our Earth is now minus 50 degrees. The power grid has been gone for years, and nations have silently collapsed under snow and famine. You hear rumors about a safe haven built deep underground powered by nuclear heat, but you probably won't get access to this. You huddle together, burning the last of your dry firewood as you prepare for another cold night. Eventually, Earth goes completely silent, like a frozen sphere drifting between stars. Rogue Black Hole, Death by Spaghettification Imagine a rogue black hole that drifts aimlessly throughout the universe. If it passed close enough to our solar system, it wouldn't suck you in like a vacuum cleaner. Instead, its gravity would distort orbits and, depending on how close it gets to Earth, even distort you. At first, the pull is gentle. Distant things move first, as if space itself is preparing for what's coming. You'd see the stars smearing into thin white arcs as space itself bends. The moon becomes a stretched out brushstroke, turning the night sky into an oil painting. You see the oceans crawling up the sky, turning the horizon into an upwards tilt. The ground bends and cracks, spitting out lava and fire. Soon you'll feel the gravity pulling harder on your feet than your head. Your body stretches, your head feels like it's floating upward while your feet fall down. You turn into spaghetti and join the stream of matter spiraling both upward and downward at the same time. You become part of the bright, shredded halo that was once your planet. And yes, you will die. So that's how you would die in every space apocalypse. Probably. But let's not fret, most of these apocalypses are either very unlikely, or so far in the future that you'll die of something embarrassingly normal long before then. Still, it's kind of humbling, isn't it? To realize how fragile we are, balanced on this tiny rock in a cosmic shooting gallery. So maybe appreciate the boring days a little more. The ones where the sky isn't on fire and the moon isn't falling. Now please enjoy this time lapse of me drawing a guy being spaghettified. It's such an eerie way to go, but honestly, it does not sound too bad. If I had to experience one of these, I'd pick this one. Which one would you pick? Let me know in the comments.